well, hate speech and fake news uh, at guidance by Julia Trüger, I'm supposed to say, a.k.a. on Twitter, you are Phenomen, at Phenomen. That's uh, what I also should add. And then you uh, wrote a long sentence. I will probably be uh, caught, caught up a couple of times. Hate and... Uh, harassment uh, politi uh, on the internet. Uh, politics is trying to get hold of that. So now uh, artificial intelligence is showing up the chances and uh, ri risks. Um, so the question is what's left to do. So thank you very much. It's a uh, great honor and uh, joy to be here and uh, be able to share my thoughts with you. I've thought a lot about uh, hate speech, uh, fake news, about all the digital Babylon, uh, but also what all these developments uh, have to do with cybernetic systems, platforms, with uh, artificial intelligence, um, what you have to know to act properly. And I can say a lot of people, um, politic politicians and media people and activists uh, don't have this knowledge. A uh, couple of words about me. Um, I have been thinking about digitalization and that's politics for about 10 years. It started with a cease and desist and at Fusion and a lot of money um, I had to pay to lawyers of Sony and it ended in a thesis about network censorship and the question about how and if uh, it content on the internet is about uh, should, should be regulated. Uh, how you can do this technically clear, and I can say it really shortly. Um, you, I said uh, you'd need precise norms and an adequate process. Uh, today it's very different. Uh, since then, I've worked for many different uh, stakeholders for society, uh, for economy, for science, uh, for civil society. Now I work for the SPD in the Bundestag, and I think about algorithms and artificial intelligence most of the time. But also the topic of content regulation never let me go. And today I am happy that um, there's developments that, that, that are relevant for many areas and uh, they are deba debated uh, on very le different levels and I want to talk about this today. So where did I start? When I started uh, this, uh, about the, talking about this topic, um, the uh, general idea was that you can't regulate uh, the general uh, the content uh, uh, generally on the internet. It's distributed, it's vast, and it's um, you, there's no central uh, authority, and uh, it's really easy to circumvent these regulations, and it's really hard to regulate it. And uh, the network net was uh, a home for freedom and democracy, but uh, when the uh, social networks rose, it changed a lot. Google, Facebook, and Co. bring on one hand, uh, the certain order back to the internet. They bring to an order um, to the uh, diversity of content. Uh, they give you an overview about the vastness of the information, but they regulate, make you, make the information regulatable. And we don't know uh, what, uh, how Facebook and Co structure the uh, content. We know that likes and personal pre uh, preferences uh, play a role, and data, data and algorithms are getting more important, and artificial intelligence. But uh, most things are completely unclear, and in comparison to the traditional media system, we don't have a, um, diversity, don't have any balance, and journalistic standards. But generally, uh, like uh, U.S. American uh, regulation, and with a very unclear premises and uh, norms and uh, values, and this content, uh, 2015. Uh, uh, very ugly phenomena appeared. Uh, hate, hate speech, social bots, fake news, uh, information war, the whole topic. Um, until today, there is uh, we are still missing uh, comparative studies until today and uh, on this topic. And uh, we have to think that um, people from um, Marginalized people have uh, attacks on marginalized people have increased, and um, they are used in a tactical way. They are used to silence and recruit uh, people and for a gender setting. Then uh, the f topic of fake news appears, lies, stories, and uh, they, that are distributed in a manipulative. Um, 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 the, and the um, technologies of uh, picture manipulation. Heise last uh, week uh, reported 
that the uh, Department of Defense in the US uh, had a competition uh, of how to create the best fakes and how to recognize the best fakes. Uh, so it's kind of a hot topic right now. I'm not telling you anything new. This is the introduction. Um, all these fake news and hate speech in social media have found a quite vast distribution. People uh, respond to emotionally extreme content a lot quicker. So right conservative people use this quite strategically and spread news quite strategically. And everything was kind of enhanced by the missing and lacking transparency within social media. All of this finally meant that echo chambers of <coughs> politicians were burst and all of a sudden we had this really, really horrible uh, network um, and this this uh, law in Germany. So this kind of um, prevents people from, no, this, this makes people having to delete uh, stuff in, on their own merits that um, is f fake. So there's about 23 different, um, there's kind of like fake news from Russia uh, that kind of threaten the outer security of the German Republic um, and leads to founding of terroristic organizations. So there's like people at Facebook who all of a sudden have to make decisions within seconds and make a call and all of a sudden a lot of actors were claiming that the system is being abused and there's so much content being taken down that shouldn't be taken down. There's no way of disputing if something has been taken down. There's no way of of punishment of hate speech and there's a catalogue of of stuff that parties are waiting for to be informed but this right to, but all of this stuff that was deleted like it's kind of a question of whether or not that was something that is uh, legally uh, punishable um, so the lawmaker has kind of prevented itself from uh, making sure that criminal law is being put into place. Uh, in doubt, they kind of just try to um, become in charge of a problem that, and I mean, because like, in doubt, like, if something that's online on 24 hours, they kind of manage to succeed at what they wanted to do, they put a new topic on the agenda or threaten somebody else. Uh, you could say that's so far so bad, um, but in the, shy, in the shadow of all of this debate about that NetsDiggy, all the big platforms started to come up with um, automating automated filter system. So like there's kind of like a company like Jigsaw that's part of Alphabet, which means Google. Uh, they're training currently algorithms to detect harassment or hate speech automated. And so there's discussions from Wikimedia or from big journals, the New York Times, for example, they, they are the ones that are being used as the data foundation of training the algorithms when somebody's leaving a discussion or normally would leave a discussion. So the comments, there's kind of, they were kind of ranked on a scale of toxic, uh, there's kind of like toxic scale. So like there's like a fictitious process that were like a, you're a horrible bitch with like five exclamation points that would and lots of like bad emoticons, so that would kind of have a toxicality level of like 92%, for example. So I'm gonna explain that later in further detail. All of that is quite extreme. Uh, this toxical filters, these filters of toxicity, um, kind of take away this idea that are actually punishable. It's just filtered out. So what used to be punishable by law and, and that were just decided by <coughs> judges and people such as that. <coughs> so Google itself says it's a quite interesting experiment, but they're sitting the ones, on, they're the ones who are sitting on the results of this experiment and I find it quite interesting. Um, myself, Twitter is doing something very similar and they're developing all sorts of automated processes against hate speech and harassment. They're using they, they did a cooperation with IBM Watson, and they're using a sentiment analysis and machine learning to 
distinguish hate speech. So it's this kind of automatic analyzation of emotions. So in Twitter, they also experiment a lot with so-called sensible, uh, sensitive contents uh, that aren't shown on all devices. There's no transparency. Uh, there's no way of uh, disputing what's going on. And Facebook is even even more extreme than any of the other ones. Zuckerberg finds it completely senseless, this whole debate about fake news and uh, making uh, public... So what he thinks is a lot cooler is if opinions were kind of ranked on a scale and it would show the user where he politically stands. Um, so if you want to um, do this on a practical level, you kind of indice all content or you rank news and news sources and users. That's kind of the way to go where Facebook is uh, currently experimenting. What you can definitely say is that there's all sorts of experiments that are that are going on. There's a lot of mistakes and errors that are happening. Julia Reda, and who's part of the Pirate Party in, in the European Parliament, she's collecting all of these. So if there's like uh, in the in the parliamentary uh, election, so if there's like all sorts of bots that are identified, you have to kind of uh, be uh, very careful because it's very very hard to automatically detect fake accounts and bots and things like that. So there's reports that YouTube accidentally deleted a lot of videos that were proof of war crimes in Syria, uh, and a lot of people were collecting that material in order to later on uh, have proof at, in the human rights courts, and that was accidentally deleted, and that was a very, very big, that's a very, very big danger and threat when it comes to this automation, automated deletion. And what I find really extreme is this one. This is uh, a report from America. This is a, an article where there was a certain tweaks in the algorithms in Google and Facebook <coughs> generated a lot less <coughs> traffic for, and then one of them was the American Civilist Union, one of the biggest NGOs that's uh, doing stuff in the digital rights sector in America, and that was, the traffic there was significantly diminished based on tweaking the algorithm. And it's super, like there's no control over this, there's no transparency, and that's why I find this so difficult. I think all this fight against fake news and hate speech, I think we definitely need something better than what we have currently right now this automated content regulation and upload filters, we need completely different solutions. But what are these solutions? I mean, that's the very big question. Now I'm gonna do a quick jump. Might you have to look at this problem from a completely different standpoint. Because it's from a technical perspective, from the platform perspective, from artificial intelligence perspective, but I'll come back to the problem of hate speech and fake news. Artificial intelligence, there uh, were People are talking a lot about it, algorithms and stuff, and uh, what will be coming and how to deal with it. And what I can say is that uh, it's not coming, it's there, but uh, different than expected. We have, in the moment, at the moment, we have, uh, in, the, in the last few years, you have to say, um, we've had breakthroughs in a lot of algor uh, analysis systems uh, connected to worldwide networking uh, with the availability of data and the exponentially grown uh, capacities of uh, computers which uh, people thought uh, have dreamt about over uh, about for years or uh, decades uh, that's learning computers so uh, we have now systems that learn uh, a lot from data and then can make decisions for, for people we can uh, analyze very complex uh, things like the identity of a human we can um, value the complex things like the national security level and we can uh, regulate uh, or um, direct uh, things like uh, autonomous sys weapons systems, for example. That brings a lot of challenges with it. So uh, algorithmic decision-making systems, so if a software makes a decision, for example, when you predict police uh, work, 
uh, based on location or people. You can also now do it based on social network and the real-time analysis of a lot of data. Um, that brings uh, a lot of challenges with it, uh, which uh, in regards of accountability and control. Um, uh, I don't know if you've seen the talk from uh, Maya, for example, about talks about Palestine, about Palestine where security uh, authorities are using social networks to identify terrorists, and then suddenly a 14-year-old terrorist a, a girl uh, uh, gets uh, in the crossfire because she was angry at her boyfriend and posted that on social media, so it's a difficult uh, topic. The, and in addition, uh, so a lot of people think that analysis with big data and uh, um, so it's, it's neutral, but n technology is never neutral. All the largest uh, the computing capacities have their boundaries. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, from the geo uh, research. You can see the different levels of neural networks, um, but in neural networks, uh, can uh, algorithms can learn to uh, horizontally or virtually. Vertically, and there's going to be different uh, results. Uh, so, if you find the first best result or the best, uh, there's a big uh, value a difference in value. And um, uh, so, basically, what, what is technical? What the technical design is makes a different, uh, d a huge difference. So, Jigsaw uh, is uh, training uh, systems to recognize hate speech. If you have, for example. T identify 10,000 comments as had hate speech. And if you ask this machine, uh, what's the uh, connection between these 10,000 comments? Uh, what are you learning uh, about that, uh, what hate speech is? The result is going to be unclear. What uh, is also is a problem is uh, that, um, uh, oh, yeah. I have to jump back to the uh, toxicity filters. So if you have a ten identified 10,000 comments as hate speech, uh, so everybody hopes that uh, the analysis of large uh, amounts of data can give us uh, new insights. New insights bring us a uh, new basis for uh, decisions and a change of norms. But um, the whole thing runs as an experiment. And it has no one has an idea what these algorithms uh, are deciding. And last we had a, um, on the legal uh, uh, part of the European Parliament, we had the decision to uh, install upload filters um, <coughs> to the, who do this automatics, which is really dangerous. So most politicians don't exactly have an idea what they're doing. Um, the political uh, economy and their um, risks. There was, was a question from Zask my boss, Saskia Eskin, to the uh, German government which algorithms they are using. And they found out that uh, the facial recognition software on Berlin Südkreuz station uh, that's tested there, the Ministry of the Interior uh, they can't say on, basis, on which basis of which data and which algorithms it was trained and works. <coughs> so in total, we have, um, in fact, uh, with this topic of artificial intelligence, we have the development of very different actors on the wo whole world, and where there were algorithms are tr created and trained, and um, the uh, things are implemented, but nobody has an overview t for any kind of reasonable risk analysis. So the, this is the whole question, what is the, why is this related to hate speech and face news? And I they have to say, and I unfortunately have to go a little step further, there's a very smart uh, scientist called Klaus Link um, who thought about uh, how algorithms can control society and this, how these algorithmic society systems and artificial intelligence can create the context of people in the way that they can do the, the right thing automatically. There's uh, films from the 40s about that. There's been a long topic. The topic has been all, it's quite old. And there's quite a few things working together there. There's, uh, on one hand, there's the personalization of the um, uh, environment of people, like Google, uh, of information, like Google, Amazon, Facebook, and code, the machine learning and telling me what I should be wanting. And then, in addition, there's the building of profiles and the 
uh, the, the op options for people and the chances. And then there's also the changes of uh, behavior through nudging. And there's uh, the in infrastructure that doesn't leave people much other chance. There's uh, It's offline at the Berlin Christmas market, but there's also online how to for people how to can want to choose the right seat on an airplane that depends on how much you can pay so nobody actually knows uh, which kind of systems are in development and in use and interact and, and uh, nobody knows if they are controlled or control themselves and uh, what is clear um, that a lot of people uh, in especially the social networks large platforms um, that uh, control the which control the uh, perception of people uh, leads to the radicalization of people in the conflicts uh, increased conflicts between people and um, <coughs> Facebook there is um, a huge amount of uh, oh, sorry um, uh, oh shit so um, that's right um, I think she skipped all the, the time she has left. Um, so she has to get a little quicker. Algorithm is in Facebook. Uh, the question is how is fast is Facebook leading to radicalization? Uh, there's so many echo chambers. There's people who say that that's uh, that doesn't exist. There was one study worldwide that uh, was conducted by Facebook employee, employees themselves. Um, and it, uh, the study uh, found out that in Facebook's newsfeed, generally, there's 6 to 8 percent of diversity that's been taken out. And then there's another reduction based on a ranking. So Facebook, hourly, weekly, about 17 percent of the content, diversity of the content is taken out. So about a fifth, just based on people who use Facebook a lot and identify politically and in the, ba the rest is probably even worse. So I kind of said that this is kind of like building the Babylon Tower. There's like step by step, people are developing different worldviews, different perceptions of problems, and step by step, they're radicalizing themselves. And additionally to that, there's obviously a strategic, uh, it's used strategically by all sorts of players to uh, distribute hate. There's the whole advertising economy that's buying into that this all these scandals on, about Cambridge Analytica and the only currency that's currently there is attention span clicks and likes and oh the, the, the slides are a bit messy and not in order I was pretty shocked uh, when last week I was trying I don't know if if you heard about the video where there's this US reporter in CNN <laughs> breaks down when she talks, when she's supposed to talk about how Trump is dealing with the children in the US at the border. Has anybody of you seen this? When I saw this, there was, I don't know, 100,000 views. I tried finding that video again uh, because I was interested. And this was what one day later I could find. I couldn't find that video anymore. I only found these advertising videos, we asked kids how Trump is doing, and this video was just gone, and I was really shocked um, that we have this kind of media bubble that instead of information and communication almost causes conflict and is a distraction of what's really and going on. Um, this media bubble is an absolute catastrophe from my standpoint. Um, there's, um, there's Trump, there's Brexit. I think we're just in the beginning of this war of information. Soon we're going to have automated weapons and all of a sudden we, and we don't really know how we're going to react to attacks on critical infrastructure. We have the problem that most a lot of resources and um, and and people are working in media Babylon and this uh, security politics instead of actually creating security is more surveilling and creating surveillance and increased surveillance and everybody is kind of pushing each other edging each other on so we have climate change we have growing social inequality and you can sort of 
shortly say this whole hate speech subject topic is just an expression of human mankind in, in fear and fear of existence, panic about climate change and migration. And if you look at it from a psychological level, if you deal with it, you kind of see that it's completely understandable that people in felt danger and fear as usually uh, use known strategies against their enemies. And you can see that in the shortest and smallest ways of competition. You can see that with the Frau Kopetri from the AfD, uh, the German right populist party currently. Uh, the whole subject of hate speech kind of covers up the fundamental reasons for this existential threat that digitalization and AI actually pose that, first of all, most technical resources, most professionals work in this media Babylon and instead of where we actually need them in the way that we use and control these AI. So I think this is a really, really big problem that the ignorance towards the real risks on humankind and I think there's a lack of clean air, clean, fresh water, nutrition, it's, it's on heating, it's on living, it's on societal organization and, and the possibilities to get in touch with the important people, so kind of infrastructure. And the third point that I wanna raise here is that most people in power and, and got leaders uh, based on this, they kind of hold on to old conflicts and ways of controlling and they, they just very unreflected uh, way deal with this, like Zehofa is one of the best examples currently right now. There's this destructive design that's being mm -hmm. enhanced, so I have to now get to my 10 ways of solving this and, and giving a bit of a solution. Um, so when I fundamentally think about ways of solutions like a in the area of AI and, and algorithms and hate speech, then I think you have to have a fundamental question of values, decision of when it comes to your values. Does everybody, n should everyone survive or no one? Mach machines cannot make that decision and make that call. We need the resources from safety, secu like from security authorities, and we need those to eliminate actual security threats. So we need an optimization of global distribution and there's this fundamental question once you've answered that if anyone or no one should survive, you can kind of ask the question of how can we manage all of this? And I think we, we really need a digital politics that uh, kind of uh, makes sure that uh, human values and humankind are being valued and put first. I think we kind of need answers to the question how are algorithmic decisions in AI uh, made and how they can be used in a good way and how it does the human well and how can we reform economic and financial systems. The good thing on all of this is the f slides are completely messed up. I'm so, so sorry. But we're at the fusion and I probably have another three minutes and thankfully not everybody's working in the wrong place. I think the fusion is one of those positive experiments that proves how you can technically manage 10,000s of people in a way that in case of danger, in case of threat, you can qu quickly evacuate. There's so many small groups that are involved in this that manage that everyone and everything just kind of runs well and so little actually happens. And the question kind of is, how can we use these networks and these network effects so that in the end you have a good whole, which can be corrected a little bit. We had a year of a break. Um, in relation to digital technology, I think we are desperately in need of a constructive design of social networks. I don't think it makes sense to recreate them. I think we have to push Facebook, Google, etc. If people are controllable, you have to use it in a constructive way. We are personalized, con we are controlled personalized, but these network processes need to be used more positively. I think there's so much that we can learn from gaming that where we step by step take 
a lot more positive incentives for the economic politics and this net nudging. If you don't take this as manipulation and and controlling, but as a potential, how by the smallest interaction and, and, and tweaking, you can actually make a difference and move a whole mass into the right direction. I think we need this coordinated digital politics of the German government. And I could say a lot more about algorithms, but I think I'm just going to let people ask some questions. Julia, we have uh, 15 minutes of questions. If you, if you still want to uh, talk a little bit about algorithms and AI, go for it. I mean, generally, AI and algorithms are really my, my topic right now. I'd love to, but I would, it kind of is up to the crowd. Do you guys want questions, or do you want to listen for another five, ten minutes? Why don't we do five minutes of contents and ten minutes of questions? Content at the content is exactly what we want. All right, the good thing about algorithms is that I can speak a lot more freely. Um, so, as I said, everything talks about ethics of algorithms. I think the question is, do we want to survive or not, and how can we manage that? If you answer that question positively, and you just kind of think about how are we dealing with algorithms and AI in front of the backdrop of not having any understanding and overview. So the first question kind of is like we need a societal overview, which technologies are being developed, which ones are in use privately as well as on a state level. So what are their data and training grounds? What actors are involved? What are the risks? What do we have to check? What do we have to certify? What do we have to forbid? What is also just kind of cool? I think there's a lot of good stuff in there as well. And um, I think we need uh, need uh, new lawmakers, like not even as lawmakers need overview. I think every single person needs an overview. I think so many people are involved. So many people had, have criticized the GDPR that was just updated and, and everybody kind of sweared about it. And like there's so much cr criticism, but even when it comes to, but to be honest, when it comes to AI and algorithms, it really is quite interesting. It gives the people the right to be informed and when they are being uh, put into uh, an, a system of like, uh, when, they're, when their data and surf behavior is being used automatically, the user is being informed. There's a lot of stuff that's good that's in there that's super interesting. There's like companies that are doing profiling are forced to and have to kind of give uh, data security risk analysis and they have to come up with concepts um, the, to uh, prevent uh, data security from being breached. Yeah. There's a lot of people who say that algorithms need to be checked and that's a very difficult thing to do because back in the days there was this algorithm auditing was part of uh, computer sciences or uh, mathematics, there was like the database and then there's modeling and you could kind of break it down and statically check these things. But today it looks completely different because this process of machine learning, there's so many feedback loops and it's really, you can really only test the input and the output and, and figure out how the system then made decisions and you just kind of need to, you need to have access to the data and having access to data is based, is restricted by all sorts of different laws. Like even if the whole world is accusing Facebook of being the cause of Trump and fake news and all that, but they're never gonna give over that data. So that's really quite difficult. Data is kind of the oil in this whole thing of algorithmic decision-making. The GDPR um, manages um, personal data, uh, their collection and their usage. What's currently not regulated, unfortunately, is all the data that is uh, generated by um, the um, search behavior and behavior of um, how long we spend on a website and stuff like that. Like all of this data, this new, are actually the base for this newest form of profiling, like all of these um, insurance companies and stuff like that. They're trying to make profiling more based on this rather than personalized data. Mrs. Macker the other day was of the opinion that data were for the AI are kind of like the food for uh, 
cows for cattle. And I was like, kind of like, oh, yeah, kind of f food for, for the animal. Yeah, that's, I think what's really important here is that you just really have to watch out that AI is getting the actual right data. And we need really, really good regulations on uh, data. And we really have to think about how we can uh, secure the quality of data sets. And this has a connection to blockchain that I don't really want to go into too deeply right now. The last thing before I finish this uh, is that we really need good machine-human intersections. Um, there's, there was a big uproar that came up with uh, the death algorithm. If we have an algorithm that would decide which cancer patient would get which therapy and if it get a therapy, and then all of a sudden like these algorithms are supposed to make decisions over life and death. If you would build a system that would then show what kind of life quality and, and lifetime span could be uh, caused by homeopathy, chemotherapy, regular therapy, or no therapy, like these, if we had possibilities like to use these algorithms to like kind of just show and, and lay open uh, all the different options, that would be quite cool actually. Um, I did quite a long, long way here. Uh, I started with hate speech and ended with algorithms. I think the problem of hate speech and fake news, we really need a much better digital politics. And for me, that means it, it's orienting itself based on human security, but not saving and securing them from others, but having elementary and fundamental goods given to you. I actually published that in the SPD position paper the other day, but there's so many people that need to enter this because we, we, we there's so many ways that are open right now, but you, you know the political scale and situation that we have. What I want to say to finalize, I thought about the technicalities of this, about these things that we need, and, and, and I know what doesn't work in the small and what can't become good in the big picture. So most of these problems are based upon completely misguided economic decisions and security decisions and that everybody just kind of sees their old enemies and thinks about their old strategies. I think we need to re-educate and unlearn a lot of things. And I don't think there is no better place than this goddamn fusion. So have a lot of fun doing it. And I'm just going to jump here in here, just an applause. We have another four and a half minutes, so we'll do five. Uh, I'm going to uh, use the mi microphone. You're going to take a quick, quick sip, big sip from the matter bottle, and I'll go into the crowd and, and get the questions. Do I need to go? I don't need to go. No questions. All right, then we'll finish up right here. Oh, no, there's a question. talked about uh, the uh, existential uh, threat from me. It's an important question, and uh, I wanted to ask you um, whether you can say something about the d where the debate is led in this dimension. So this is present, and I, I, I'm, um, I'm well. I'm just trying to start it. Um, basically, in the 80s, when digitalization was planned in Germany. People uh, wondered how to lead the digitalization in a way that it can be used in a, for good. And uh, the post ministry and the education ministry, then there were came internet and the telecommunication set sector was privatized. The Germany reunified and then um, then it got, got lost. And then it was about digital make uh, create acceptance for digitalization and then. Uh, make the uh, economy uh, ready for competition. And I think these platforms are leading towards that the connection interconnections are not seen. They're just amplifying um, things and they're the, the, the individual things. So um, scientists are talking about artificial intelligence or the big data or, well, the individual topics are not working together. The environmental uh, uh, 
uh, movement that led to this discourse in the 80s, uh, putting it back on their agenda and their na agenda, but they don't have a starting point, and they're putting uh, sustainability on their on their uh, talking about sustainability, but they don't know about how this alg algorithms and data, big data, uh, are interconnected with that. <coughs> So then uh, they need to know how to use the good things in a better way and not uh, just diminish um, the whole thing in, in total. And no one is really have the, no one has this really on the radar. Don't have to look. There's another question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. You uh, talked about a little about the algorithms. Um, I got the feeling that um, there's a censorship and a washing wishy washy effect and um, and uh, mostly on Facebook and Google and mainly it's uh, communications politics security politics but uh, many people uh, have this on the radar but uh, how is it with uh, cancer therapy uh, healthcare systems life quality insurance uh, systems uh, is it on their radar as well and that might also have a much that might have a much bigger impact, but uh, Facebook. Well, face I know f that Facebook is more or less fake news, and that uh, I don't didn't understand your question. Is politics also debating, uh, and nerds are debating that it's next to Facebook, and that uh, it's also about um, the also insurance systems and uh, healthcare systems uh, playing with big data. Um, I think the thing is that the, those with, who have the most data to feed um, artificial intelligence are the big platforms, the big five, uh, and uh, the data are uh, they collect, collected there, and then you can develop with them. And that is like, uh, and based on feedback data, they have a lot of um, advantage you can't really catch up with. Morozov wrote, uh, Morozov wrote an article that probably Facebook and Google will move from a advertising financed model uh, to for example go to hospitals talk to with talk with national health service in the UK um, they are doing the data analysis for different uh, reasons there and it's not only the only uh, area but the biggest one are not all these big platforms and the security uh, uh, services as well authorities Everywhere else, it's missing. Fraunhofer, Fofa, Focus had uh, would like to have good nerds to help uh, work building artificial intelligence for good things in the in um, administration, for example, because they're you know they they have a lot of needs. If we want to keep up and uh, hold our standard of a living, in for example, in Sachsen Anna, there's uh, tens uh, of doctors and uh, state attorneys missing, and we have to automatize uh, um, law and medicine uh, partially. And we have to keep an eye on that it happens right in the right way, and there's a lot missing. And standardization, digitalization of documents, uh, technology analysis everywhere, and it's a catastrophe. catastrophe. Uh, Julia, we got on point. Thank you very much. That was hate speech and fake news. Uh, uh, Direction for by Julia Krüger uh, at Phenomen on Twitter, and that's your applause. Thanks.